The working the room, working the room, yeah. Oh, were we on already? Yeah, when I did? <laughs> we're on. <laughs> I thought that was beforehand. No, no we, we got a chance to see the Joe Tynan act where you go through and work everybody's everybody. hand. I didn't shake everybody's hand, <laughs> but they look like they'll vote for me anyway. They will vote for you. <laughs> they will vote for you. Uh, so great to have you here, and what a kind of fun time this is for you. Uh, you're getting to be a, here with you. Yeah, to be here with me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? You've made it so far now. <laughs> Things are finally going your way. I know. Thank God. I've dreamt about this. I was a little boy, nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of us has been dreaming about this since they were nine. I'm not sure which one. Yeah. But, but uh, it's so much fun, everything that you're doing now with Stony Brook. And uh, it seems like you've been working... Well, how long now have you been involved in scientific stuff? Well, a long time. Uh, I think I started doing science programs on PBS almost 20 years ago. I can't really remember. And still that same passion is still there today. Oh, yeah, more yeah. so. I mean, the, in the course of that, of doing those science shows, like Scientific American Frontiers and two or three other series we did, um, I, I, I've got an understanding of how I could get the scientists to be more personal and more direct and, and clear about what they had to say by making personal contact with them. You know, I would, I'd, I'd really make them talk to me and explain to me what they were talking about mm -hmm. and to, to drop the jargon so I could understand it. It was, it was, I was sincere about that too. I didn't know more than I, pretended to or didn't know less than i can't remember i got into that sentence and got in trouble <laughs> yeah right but, but uh I, I i didn't try to be i didn't try to be dumber than i was and i didn't try to be smarter than i was i tried that second one for a while and that really didn't yeah. work it's no good to pretend you know what you're talking about if you're interviewing somebody sure. you, you must have found this too yeah because you can box somebody in with a question that doesn't really relate to what they know or what they do. And then they have to like squirm out of your question because they don't want to be impolite. Mm -hmm. So I would start out from not knowing anything, which is pretty much where I was. And, and then they would have to really make it clear to me. And then I realized that if they didn't have somebody like that to talk to, they would go on probably lecturing and go into right. lecture mode when they talk to an audience or when they wrote a, an article. So what, what could we do to help them be more personal the way they were when somebody sincerely wanted to understand them? And then I realized that I, that I could, there were things I knew about communication that I could pass on to them if they were willing to get in the same room with me. For instance, improvising. What, what I learned as an improviser and not, I don't mean comic improvising. I mean, the kind of improvising that Viola Spolin like 60 or 70 years ago invented. Um, which are very rule based and uh, lead to connection between the players, which then turns out sometimes to be funny because it just it just makes you giggle when you see people connect. Right. And and I experimented with some scientists, young scientists, and it really did help them connect with the audience that they wanted to talk to. And then we could apply some of those same things to teaching writing. They they learned the writing skills better once they had done the improvising. So it was a whole set of um, realizations and epiphanies we had that there was something that we could do to help them be more communicative. And they love it. They really, and we've seen un unbelievable transformations. Well, we have a couple that are really good yeah. at it today. Bob Green is fantastic. Neil deGrasse. Tyson is very comfortable with it. And you can see that these guys actually get fans, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, I think, where you want to get up to, where people can say, I want to follow their work from this. Yeah, point you want to hear about you want to hear what they have to say if you can understand it. But it's not and it's not only the public, you know, the, um, the public, first of all, has to support science if science is going to get funded because right. they'll complain uh, to their representatives but it, when scientists go to the representatives in congress and try to explain the science there's it's unbelievable how many members of congress have said they can't understand the scientists 
And why would they give money to people who are doing work they don't understand? Right. Well, they, they, they've tried that. They, they, <laughs> they kind of do that <laughs> all the time. Right. And, and, and it doesn't really work, you know? Well, the media also will run back and forth and, you know, bring up some research thing that they don't understand and make yeah. fun of it. And that sets yeah, there science was a, back. Uh, I, I, was it Senator Proxmire yeah. years ago, a couple of decades ago, used to have the Golden Fleecing Award. Mm -hmm. And he would he would find some obscure um, study on, like, um, how bad is mouth, b mouse breath or something mm -hmm. like that. You know? Yeah, right. And, and he would say, isn't that stupid? They're studying mouse breath. And... Um, and denigrate all of science when, in fact, he, that mouse breath study might have been very important to, on, on the road to curing cancer or who knows what. But, right. but he would find something that sounded stupid and give it an award, which was, I always thought, kind of anti-intellectual. I didn't know why he did it, because he seemed to be a smart guy. Well, anti-intellectual, I think, helps politicians. I'm a regular guy. Yeah, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm more like That's you. That's true. Yeah, I think like you're right. Not like these eggheads, yeah. uh, you know, and it, it seems to help them get over. So you want to bring science uh, to a place where the American public can understand it. Yeah, and, and, and you know what we find, that the, it, it, it helps with the public. It helps with people who are setting policy and, and giving grants mm -hmm. for them to understand it better. And it helps scientists communicate with one another. Because interestingly, if a scientist is not in your exact field, and maybe even in your own laboratory, but is separated by some intellectual distance from you, you might not understand each other very well. The same word is used by two different scientists to mean different things sometimes. And and this is all for a good reason, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you don't want scientists to stop using technical terms when they're doing their science because it's more efficient and it's more accurate. But you can still be accurate and clear when you're talking to people who don't speak your language. And if scientists can understand one another across disciplines, they can collaborate better. And more and more, new things are happening, really valuable things are coming around because two different disciplines that never got together before are now suddenly able to get together. And they can get together more quickly and better if they can be clear with one another. Clear and vivid is all we're trying to do, not to dumb it down and make it make it um, oversimplified. You know, I remember Einstein is supposed to have said, a thing should be as simple as possible, mm -hmm. but no simpler. No, no simpler. <laughs> well, and I guess since, they're, since the Internet, they're all able to read each other's work in real time and work yeah. together where if you think of Einstein, if he wanted to talk to somebody else, he probably had to get on a boat to go yeah. and do it, you know? Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, well, they would send letters to each other. Um, it's funny, I, that period of time when he was doing his breakthrough work, uh, that whole, no, for f five or ten years in there, really seems very vivid to me because I've read about him. I did a little theater piece about him based on his letters that we did at the World Science Festival a couple of years ago. I think we're going to do it again this year. And I also wrote a play about Marie Curie, and, and who was alive at the same time. He, he, he said about her, uh, there was a time she was involved in a scandal um, because she was, after her husband was dead, she had an affair with a married man. And that was really, it was okay for him, but not for her. But not for her, yeah. But, you know, I mean, then at, at the time, women just weren't allowed to behave in any way like men or have men's ambition. So Einstein wanted to defend her. And he said to, to a friend, I don't think she had an affair. She's about as alluring as a herring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, it's funny when you see those pictures of him with his shock of white hair, you don't yeah. think of him as a ladies man, but he was in his younger pictures. He looked kind of arrogant about, about how, he thought he could uh, bowl you over with his charm. Well, it had and he to... did. He had a lot of a uh, lot of uh, friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was the alpha dog, I guess, of his I, time, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, if you were going to be with a scientist, right? Might as well. <laughs> so, hey, hey, honey, you, do you like relativity? <laughs>
Uh, Brian Green with the with like string theory, he could re- if he weren't happily married, he could really do well now. Yeah. He he does have groupies, I believe. Yeah, I bet he does. They follow yeah. him around. Yeah, and I, he's know. a wonderful guy. You know, I'm very curious, and every time we meet and we see each other a lot because we work together on the World Science Festival, I always just out of the blue ask him some question that about something I'd just been reading that day, and he stops whatever he's doing and he explains it to me. He loves to explain. That's what I love about scientists. Yeah. They love to help you understand new things, and and they don't you know they they don't speculate with you. They 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 tell you about what seems to be really known. And because they love to teach like that, I want to make it possible for them to make it clear to more of us because they can, because they will then have a greater ability to make it clear. Well, see, I think that's what was great about the shows that you would do is because you would go in there, uh, ready to learn because a lot of men find it difficult to say, geez, exp- you know, slow this down, explain yeah. it to me. Well, yeah, I, I had to go through a period where, I was willing to to not know in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, there was a critical moment where I was interviewing Carl Sagan, and I thought the interview went really well. And afterwards, the producer <laughs> said, well, "Why don't we have a cup of coffee?" <laughs> <laughs> coffee is a sure. So anybody asks you for a cup of coffee, don't yeah. go. <laughs> he said, uh, I couldn't understand why you wanted to look smart during that interview. Right. And I, I, I my face got red and I, my first reaction was to deny, you know, <laughs> to myself that, oh, what's he talking about? And then I thought about it and he was right. I was trying to look smart. And the funny thing is, you get smart by asking questions, not by looking smart. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you know something. And I and I began to learn more because I would really ask basic questions and I'd say, I, I, it, it really doesn't make sense. So tell me again. It doesn't match what you just said a minute ago to my mind. And then they'd have to make the connection for me because one of the problems is we often don't make the connections. We're, we're so used to the connections. We say, there's this and then, and then there's that. And, and we say, well, how'd you get from this to that? And that that's how we can understand it. That's how we can put our fingers on it. But the but the thing about it, I think that's so great, is that you show uh, that science is fun because yeah. we we didn't grow up that way. You know, we were in no. school, and they kind of beat our natural curiosity out of us as we, you know, tried to use our memory for different things. I re- my experience in school, which was probably way earlier than yours, was that questions. They, they, you weren't in, you weren't invited to explore a subject. You were asked to remember what they told you. Yeah. And I remember one biology class where the teacher said, uh, "We it's been learned that crying releases certain toxins and it's good for you." So I raised my hand and I innocently said, "Well, what about laughing? Does that do anything?" He said, "Please, we're serious here." <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> <laughs> and about 30 years later, they came up with the idea that laughing is good for you. Sure. So I hope he rots in hell that day. <laughs> <laughs> Only I believed in hell. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> what a breakthrough. <laughs> there is no heaven, but there is a hell. Uh, yeah, right. That, that would be good, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, did... Did your experience in acting help you in this? Like, do you create the kind of role of an interviewer, though? Or do you... Oh, not at all. No, no. I, just, I just no. But my experience in acting, the only thing I ever studied in acting, or the only kind of training I ever had was in improvisation, uh, and that I use. That to me, that was the most one of the most valuable things about learning to act was learning to improvise, and I use that. I use it in conversation with people because it's basic it's not making things up improvising is not making things up that's writing and 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 one of the things you're encouraged not to do when you improvise is to write on your feet to keep your mind working on stuff inside your head the main thing about improvising is to get in touch with the other person observe them carefully read their face read their voice read their state of mind and that makes things come out of both of you that you didn't know were in there that's where that's where the 
the unexpected things you both say come from. And that's why it, it's funny, even if it's not jokey. In fact, it's it's almost never jokey. But but it makes you giggle because you're seeing something real take place. Right. Which is unusual. Yeah, you know, it is unusual. Yeah, particularly on TV. Yeah. You know, to see something or, real. Or when husbands and wives talk. Mm -hmm. then that's it's unusual for them <laughs> yeah. sometimes to listen to each other. Don't, isn't that a, a weird thing of seeing a couple in a restaurant and they go through a whole meal and don't say anything to one another? Mm -hmm. And then I, I've, I once I've more than once i've seen the, the woman after about 45 minutes point to the food and say something and he would go uh. <laughs> <laughs> but at least she was working on it <laughs> yeah it was getting it a little at a time yeah, yeah yeah well you know but the fact is to go back to what was fun about science is about being curious and most people i think as we lose any curiosity or or put it behind us that's when boredom sets in mm -hmm. and we think we know it all. Yeah. And one of the, the great things that I see what you do with science is they're not only really uh, excited about some of the really big things, but you could bring almost any problem to solve and suddenly it's fun for them. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and one of the things that I would love to see happen is scientists get more communicative. And all of us can get more communicative. Sure. It's not me putting myself above them at all. I've gotten better as I've focused on this. One of the things I'd like to see is the public getting an awareness of the way scientists think and to think more like them, to base their ideas, their opinions more on evidence, to question the evidence, question where it came from. I mean, I, uh, I it's habitual with me now when somebody says, you know, Taking vitamin L really improves your sex life. And I like to say, where did you read that? Right. You know, was that in Hustler? <laughs> <laughs> because then it would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> There's the data that you're looking for. <laughs> well, I think what's great, too, is that, that they can fall in love with not knowing the answer. Where I think the public, most of us, want a quick answer we're yes. used to quick answers yeah. and that's why the media will try to give us a quick answer or politicians yeah. will try to give us a but to but to relish uncertainty yeah and I, I think of it as surfing uncertainty you know you get you get by you don't sink into uncertainty but you just manage to skid along the top of it and get somewhere but you it's like I mean, it's, it's, I guess it is a little like skimming across the ocean. You don't want to sink in and drown, but you want to get someplace, but you have to recognize the existence of the ocean and you have to accept it and use it. Or uncertainty can get us many, many places. We don't need to get to certainty. We, we need to get more and more understanding of where we are and what we're involved in. I say that that's my view for me. I mean, I can't tell other people what to think. Well, I can, but they don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can embrace that, if you yeah. can really hold on to that, it can become very enjoyable. Not yeah, knowing yeah. The it can. It really can. Yeah. That, <clears throat> that I don't see. Um, I don't see more enjoyment. I mean, I've had it both ways, and I don't see more enjoyment in believing I know the answer to most things than in knowing I don't know the answer to most things, almost anything, and and just trying to find out more about it. It's just fun. It's more it's more playful. It is you know, people who know the answer to things don't seem as playful as people who what, what did I start to say? I, I got lost in the middle of it. People who seem to know the answer, think they know the answer to everything, don't seem as playful as people who don't really know and they just want to fool around and see how far they can get. And then when it is playful um, suddenly it doesn't feel like work anymore. Right, exactly. And yeah. I think yeah. that's... That, that's why I would think that education could improve if it got more playful. And, and yeah. then I read this, this article. Did you read this a couple of weeks ago by, a, I think, an economist who said we're spending... Wish I, I got to look it up and find his name. We're spending too much money on on education that comes too late, that we should be making sure that babies and early, you know... And, young children are spoken to and read to more and that would develop their brains better and when they get into school you don't have to do so much remediation or any 
Well, remember how much when you were a really little kid, you were into research. No matter, yeah, you oh, go I into was. that backyard yeah. and everything, you know, caterpillars, ants, all that stuff, yeah. you're curious about the world. And then somehow along the way, we start to squeeze it that out. That may be a natural process, too. I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to blame it on education completely because uh, there are a lot of wonderful teachers and, and we, we've all had one or two teachers, at least, who opened our minds and our hearts and w who we knew were really worried about and caring about how mm -hmm. we were doing, not just intellectually, but as people. And 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 they probably teach well, or I felt they, ta they taught me well. But there's there's still something that we could do, I think, to make learning happier. And more fun. I, I certainly, I see, but my education was a long, I mean, my formal education was a long time ago. Since then, I've learned most of what I know um, from other people and from reading. My my The actual years I spent in education, they only taught me, I think, two things. One was to think clearly, and the other was to use language. And everything else has kind of been superseded by reality. That, for instance, I, I remember a geography class in grade school where I had to learn how many tons of coffee Brazil produced that year. I yeah. really don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't care then very much either. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really, what difference does it make? I don't yeah. quite get it. Unless you know how many tons were produced by everybody else and what difference it makes to the, to that country and the whole world. They never got into that. Yeah. That would be interesting. And, of course, like you said, it, when they're having us memorize whatever about John F. Kennedy or, Li or Lincoln, they don't teach us how that person started to think to get to that point. Yeah, that's And right. I, I think that's some of the great work that you've done in, with these scientists is figure out how they get from one point to the next. I think that's really important. And I, I want to see the, the, you know, science is a great detective story. And when it's presented like a detective story, it's like we were trying to find this out because it was so important, the equivalent to who did the murder. Here's where we looked. Didn't work. It was a blind alley. Oh, we felt terrible. We didn't know what to do. Somebody said this. Try that. Oh, that didn't seem possible. We tried it. Oh, my God. Look what happened. You know, that's that's fascinating. But you don't get it that way, especially in in the um, the more abstruse articles. You get the answer first, and then, and then everything is sort of... Um, it's not it's not exciting after that you know you sure. know you know you're not led to it um but i was going to you reminded me of something else and i and this is the thing about improvising you, you st if you don't stay in the moment you can't stay in any other moment <laughs> <laughs> so do go on uh, um, well uh, now you don't even know what to say who now who <laughs> out of maybe all somebody <laughs> over here what would the, you like to know you know i i checked with them earlier and they were just like i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> um out of all the people that you met was there somebody that re or or studied was yes somebody, you, you just me yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, I know that you, you did the work on Feynman and stuff like that. Oh, was yeah. I never met Feynman, Richard Feynman, the great yeah. physicist. But I did a play um, about him, and I loved playing Feynman. Um, there was one guy I always think of. Uh, his name is Verme. And uh, I interviewed him on Scientific American Frontiers. And he he studied shells and... He was interested not in beautiful shells, but in shells that had a hole almost drilled all the way through them. Because that was a turning point in the evolution of that animal's history. Because a, a predator had tried to drill through and suck out the, the animal under the shell. But the shell was thick in that point, at that part of the shell, and couldn't, the predator couldn't make it all the way through. So, that would have been a turning point. Its progeny would have had shells that were thick there. And he was fascinating about this. The interesting thing about him is that since he was three years old, he was blind. And he did all of this work on shells with his fingers. And he'd be talking to him. He'd have his hand in a drawer. And while he's talking, he's fooling with the shells. And he <laughs> says, oh, I never saw one like that. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting guy. Yeah. And and you'll walk into something like that 
by trying not to research it too much. Did yeah, that? I wouldn't. I, I tried in the beginning. I tried to read everything I could. Mm -hmm. And that gave me this false impression that I knew something. And I would start asking questions based on what I thought I knew. And I would really corral them badly. And I could see them squirming. And after the Carl Sagan coffee incident, <laughs> I, I, uh, I tried not to do that. And, and I became more comfortable and happier. And I learned more. I really learned more because I heard it from them instead of from my misreading of it. And I think, too, when you look back at your career, the fact that you played George Plimpton, mm. who kind of lived his life as, you know, as a the, participatory journalist, yeah, I guess, yeah. just leap into things. Uh, let himself get turned over a few times until he understood. Yeah, and he was, it's interesting, even though he participated in the in the football he reported on the, with the Detroit Lions or in the New York Philharmonic playing a triangle, he never thought he was a musician or a sports person. He was reporting all the time. He was in there doing it to see what it was like and also to be able to talk to the other people who did it. So... Well, I'm, I've made, in a way, made a, and with the science stuff, I've made a show out of me learning, and I really am in there to learn. That's why I wanted to do it. But it's r mainly in the service of helping them express what they've learned about nature through science. And also helping the people at home learn yeah, as you're doing yeah, that. Right. Um, yeah, usually if I get it, then they get it. Yeah. Or maybe they get it a step ahead of me, which is makes, <laughs> makes them feel like a million bucks. But also, even if you don't get it, you just go back to that thing of at least I have a, a really cool question to keep yeah. in the back of my head. Yeah, well, I, uh, it was rare that we came away without me finally getting some glimmer. Yeah. Because we, we, I'll just spend hours of tape. Just I took Eric Lander, the the... DNA guy, I grabbed him by both cheeks and shook his head, and I said, "I don't understand what you're talking about." <laughs> and he was—he's very good-natured, and he he <laughs> backed down a few steps and got me into it. But you know, some of the people who do it really well, Feynman is like this. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and Dr. Green, er, when, uh, er, Eric Kandel is yeah. terrific. But when they're really explaining it to you. In a lot of ways, it feels like philosophy, and it also feels like comedy. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? It's yeah. just laid out in a way that is joyful. Yeah. You know, joyful. And philosophy is science without the research. You know, right? I mean, it's like, right. what do you suppose? <laughs> what do you suppose perception is? <laughs> well, perception is when a tree sort of gets in your head. <laughs> Right. That's and, true. And then, and then they start studying the brain and say, no, the tree doesn't go into your head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so philosophy is science, but with wine. You can drink the whole time. <laughs> you can sit and drink the entire yeah, time. Yeah. And they're starting to get together. There are philosophers who are basing their work, I think, now more on science. Mm -hmm. and But they still, I guess, are uh, important to scientists in, in a way that uh, that they can take what's known about science and sort of integrate it into other things that are known and um, raise other speculative questions. I I have the feeling they don't answer questions as speculatively as they used to. Because mm -hmm. that used to be, they, unless they had been introduced to the scientific method, all they had to go on was speculation. Aristotle, maybe this, one of the smartest people alive at his time, he said some very stupid things. He <laughs> said some things that I think were wonderful. Um, about like um, drama, he he, I think was I think the first one to write about dramatic action. What is at the heart of a play that makes a play work, and it's at the heart of all acting. And um, in that same essay, the, the poetics, he he also said a woman is not a fit subject for a play, you know, <laughs> or a slave, or a slave. Yeah, he just cut out most of humanity. <laughs> yeah, just half. Yeah, yeah, you had to be like a rich guy. Yeah. And then, and then, um, but it, that, that, see, all of that stuff can change. That everybody should have an opinion. Everybody should express it because it's all on the way to getting somewhere, I think, as long as we listen to sure. one another and don't denigrate one another. And there's never one person that you could say they have it all. Right, right. Uh, someone yeah. said to me once, no one book, no one teacher. 
And I thought that was perfect. That's great. People ask me who's my favorite actor. I have, it's the same principle. There are moments, performances, or just moments in performances that I relish on the part of other actors. But no one has been consistently, overwhelmingly terrific. Or, or, you know, they're entitled to mistakes the same, same way everybody is. And Brando couldn't play every part. I mean, there no, was he couldn't play my father's part in Guys and Dolls. It's amazing. You know, my father did this Sky Masterson in Guys and Dolls on Broadway, and then uh, Brando was cast for I guess understandable reasons. They thought he could do anything, but he couldn't do it as well as my father could. I don't say that because he was my father. Right. I say it because he had control over my mind. <laughs> <laughs> No one saw that one coming. <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> uh, your father was a fantastic actor, and you... He was, by the way, there's an example of what I was just saying. He was brilliant as Sky Masterson. Mm-hmm. He was not so good in many other parts. I, 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 I wouldn't say that in public if he were still alive, but, I mean, it, it is true that he was... He started in burlesque, and he had many... Um, of the many traits of the performer and not as many traits of the serious actor. And I think there's a difference, sure. but he was a great performer and he, he had a, had contact with an audience that was so charismatic. They just couldn't take their eyes off him, but he was playing a character in guys and dolls where he was a gambler who dressed sharp and was smooth. And he could do that so well. N- nobody else could play that part the way he could. Was it typecasting? Was no, it, uh... no. He was a very sweet guy. Yeah, very, very gentle, very um, interesting. It was only later in life, because I had a competitive relationship with him for most of my life. It was later in life that I realized how he really never told me what to do. He was a controlling person, but he would always say, "Well, Butch, you know, <laughs> maybe that's maybe you ought to try this. I don't know, you know, like that." And yeah. It was very, um, very, very um, f- forgiving and easy with me i liked it i don't know why i was so competitive with him well is that the reason why you entered the same field or did you feel competitive once you entered that field no i but no i think i was oh i don't know that's a good question i can't remember but i do remember when um when i got into acting i i deliberately went toward being an eccentric comic rather than a leading man, because he had that sewn up. So I wanted to have my own area. You were going to go off and find your own spot. Yeah. And then as I got older, I had to be a leading man, because that's I, that's what I was the right age for, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so I, I could accept that and didn't feel like did my own version of it. You uh, had the opportunity to have him on MASH. Yeah, you? yeah, twice. Uh, and that was... Uh... Everybody was watching that on one hand to see the show, but also knowing this is you and your dad together. Yeah, and and I lo- the first show was written by someone else. The second time I wrote the show and based it on our relationship at the time, which and, and it was in a loving way. And he was so generous; he didn't mind because I based it on the idea that I painted his character as a very controlling guy. He would say, "Well, why are you eating the sandwich that way?" You know. <laughs> and that would drive Hawkeye crazy. So all during the show, they have this repartee going where they're getting on each other's nerves. And then this was very interesting. He read the script or he heard my idea for the script. And he said, you know, I have an idea. How about this? They're at an aid station and there's an explosion and each one is wounded and he says, my right arm is wounded and your left arm is wounded and we have to operate together, each using the other hand. I said, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and I thought, what a stupid idea that is. What what a tin pan alley idea. He's going back to burlesque. And, what, and then I said, I had a hell with it. He, give him give him that. It's, a, it, it's, it's probably a good idea. Well, the, it was a terrific idea. And when we did it, this amazing, magical thing happened. While we were doing it, we were, as you said, we weren't just these two characters. We were father and son. 
and we were collaborating, each one the, the hand of the other. And it wasn't just the fake operation on the patient. We were getting through the scene together. We were as close as you can be. Our, our, our hands were cooperating with each other. And it became a, a very important moment that I remember with my father. And partly because I didn't make myself superior to him and think he has an idea less valuable than mine would be. I, and I began to realize he had a terrific idea. And he gave us a moment as a father and son we might never have had. That's fantastic. That'll be $50 for that story. <laughs> I mean, you realize how valuable these stories are? <laughs> these are, yeah. Everyone's going to le leave here just a better person. Just, uh, <laughs> I was going to call home. Dad? <laughs> You're not as stupid as I thought. <laughs> That is really uh, one of the first signs of maturity, isn't it? When I you, think it is, yeah. When you finally see that guy who you either idolized or were angry, whatever it has, as, as being a guy. You know? A person who makes mistakes the way you do, and you can sometimes be helpful, sometimes you can give advice, sometimes you can still listen to advice, sometimes you just trade ideas or let each other be not even have to have an effect on the other person. When you can do that with a parent or a friend mm. or the taxi driver, mm. then it's pretty good. You know, you made me think, too, when you said about writing those, uh, you wrote so much for MASH. When you got that show and became a big hit, most actors would have just thought, this is great, I'm going to ride this out. But you used that time to start writing and directing and yeah. adding responsibility. Well, I had always wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer when I was eight years old. And it wasn't until much later in life, when I was nine, that I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> 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 and my father took me out on stage with him at the Hollywood Canteen, where we'd entertain sailors and soldiers. Uh, and uh, this was during World War II. And uh, we would do Abbott and Costello routines, and I was Costello. And that was the first time I was on stage in front of a crowd. And it, it was amazing to me when I got the first laugh that I realized I had power over a thousand people who carried guns. <laughs> <laughs> it was really a terrific feeling. Um, I wandered off into a an, side alley just now again. I forget what we were talking about. Well, we were talking about the, was interesting. Yeah, the, the fact that you used that time to become oh, a writer oh, and yeah, director. Yeah, and... It was interesting because it was about me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I recognized the topic. <laughs> um, I always w wanted to be a writer. That was what I wanted to be first, you know. And and I began directing movies when I was 11 years old. I had a, a little a wind up uh, Bell and Howell movie camera, and I would edit. I would. Uh, I think I. I think I even edited them in, in those days. But I would make up stories, and I had a horse. And I think I held somebody up. I was on my horse and they were in a car because they didn't have two horses. So, <laughs> so uh, I, had, I had a little story. Did So I, I always wanted to do those things. And I, I was able to improve my myself in, in those jobs as I was on, while I was on mesh. And knowing that this is going to lead to the. Next step for you. I mean, was that it or was it just about doing each mash episode on its own? I mean, well, you was just trying film? to get better. That's yeah. all. <clears throat> that's all it was. I wasn't trying to, you know, advance a career or anything. I, I don't understand uh, actors or people in the arts who have a five year plan. I don't think you can. Do you? No, I can't. Uh, I would like to. I mean, this is this, un <laughs> <laughs> this is this uncertainty thing we were talking about. I mean, especially for artists or people in in the arts, you you. Uh, you don't know what's going to come around the corner. You don't know no. if you're going to get a drought or a, or a feast or or the locusts will hit. Usually it's the locusts. It's the locusts, but you just got to play it no matter yeah. what. When, yeah. when the locusts hit, you got to go, you how say, do I make this tonight work? Tonight for dinner, we're having locusts. <laughs> we're having locusts. Yeah. 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 Uh, when you um, would write and direct, it always would be about human stories, though. You were never yeah. an no. action guy. And I, was just talk I talked to Cal Burnett not too long ago. About how much I love the movie. Did you movie. talk about me? Yes, I did. I talked about <laughs> Four Seasons. Oh, you did? And no. what a... I was kidding. Fantastic <laughs> film that was. And she said it was one of the 
best experiences she ever had. Oh, that's nice. We had a wonderful time making that because Carol and I were friends and a um, couple of other people in, um, in the movie were, were f friends with me. And we all became friends. We had three weeks of rehearsal, most of which we devoted to becoming friends. And, and I said on the first day, we have to be friends by the time we shoot this movie because that's going to show on screen. And it's all about friendship. So everybody, it was so funny. Everybody immediately started telling bathroom stories about themselves. <laughs> it was kind of a, on a on a mad quest to be personal and and reveal themselves to one another. But it did break the ice. Yeah. I thought I would tell you one now. <laughs> but never mind. Well, I always loved that film because of the fact that. Uh, you know, you can see that film when you're 20, it might mean one thing to you, but mm. as you get your 40s and older, <laughs> yeah. uh, you you can see that if there's any kind of problem in the village, it affects everybody. Yeah, that's it? true. And and I, it's funny about that movie. I, I wrote it uh, uh, to a great extent from personal experience. There was a friend who got a divorce and he didn't tell me he was going to get a divorce. And I was mad at him for not telling him. It's none right. of my business. Right. You know? But uh, that's, that's, that's a, a big element in the movie. And, and yet, although I was really tr very careful about how I structured it and I was working very hard on it, I didn't really understand what it meant. Well, or at least what it meant to me until it was all done and shot. And I had to go around the country being interviewed about it. And then I suddenly realized what the movie was about. That to me at that time, it was about how you make friends with people and you go through. And this is I remember that how I used to say it. You, you meet them in the springtime mm -hmm. and everything, everything is blooming and beautiful. And then it's summer. And in the white heat of the summer, you start in the glow of the sun, you start to see them for what they really are. And then in the fall, the leaves fall away and you start to see really who they are. And then in the winter, you have to make a decision. Am I going to stick with these people forever or am I going to ditch them? And and it's funny. Somebody stopped me on the street the other day and said, this is like 30 years later, said this son, there's a line in four seasons that's kept me going where Carol Burnett says to my character, I don't want to die without friends. So she's urging me to make peace with our friends and stick together with them. And I came home and told Arlene about, I'm so glad I wrote that line in that movie because this woman said that to me. And Arlene said, I gave you that line. <laughs> <laughs> Screw her, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, somebody had to get it out there. Yeah, you know? somebody had to put it. Let her yeah. get a deal with a movie company. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows if Paul Revere, you know, came up with his line, but he you had to get British it out. the your company was said by somebody, <laughs> somebody else? Somebody else. Oh, here, my God. Here you go. Here's your line. <laughs> Here's your Tell line. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's going over. Should it be the British are coming? <laughs> oh, the, the burgers are coming. <laughs> the burgers the, are coming. The, <laughs> who ordered the burgers? <laughs> Uh, another thing that uh, I think that is such a natural place for you is when you work with Woody Allen. Yeah. The Woody Allen films that you've done are some of my uh, favorite work. My, that one them. I was lucky to be in. I, lo I love the three I was in very much. The, but the Crimes and Misdemeanors, I think, is his That's, best movie. And one of the best movies ever made by our I agree. country. It's such a serious and and movie. And the, the fun, the humorous stuff is very human. Not jokey, and, and I and I really love it for those two reasons. Well, you also get one of the great show business lines of <laughs> yeah. "If it bends, it's so funny." And I've heard and if it breaks, it's not. If it's not, yeah. if it bends, it's funny. If it yeah. breaks, it's not. But I've heard people try to explain that type of thing when they're talking about well, how, now you started as a comedian right yeah i started because you haven't been that funny today no no today <laughs> this is eventually if you're not funny enough they sit you down <laughs> you don't stand up anymore oh, right, right. <laughs> just That's sit it. down so talk. standing you're funnier <laughs> stand if we were standing i'd be killing this <laughs> So, so uh, when as a comedian, now it's, I brought that up because you started as a comedian. You said something about oh, oh. So did you yeah. find that that it was true? If it bends, it's funny. If it breaks, it's not. Well, I think what happens is when people try to explain what they want you to do with your act, they yeah. do this in radio, and they'll go, 
go up to the line but oh. not over and you're oh. like does that mean anything you, yeah. you know the, how do you know when you're over the line yeah you don't know when you're but they feel like their job is done yeah right you know? and i was i was one night uh co-hosting the oscars with uh jane fonda and robin williams and robin williams you know is just like plugged in to some place in outer right. space <laughs> And and he he would come off stage and he'd say to me in the wings, uh, "What do you think? Is this tasteless? Uh, if I say this?" And he'd say something utterly tasteless, and I say, mm -hmm. "Yeah, that's tasteless." <laughs> and he'd go out and say it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where he got his. Uh, I mean, they kept it in the show and everything. <laughs> so he, apparently, he could get away with it. But where? How do you know where the line is? If you listen to some inner voice, how do you know who's speaking? It is exactly true. And I love that thing of of what you and Woody had yeah. in that film. I mean, talk about a controlling person. Oh, it, yeah, right. It was fantastic. Right. Yeah, trying to control his own biographical film. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Such good work. Um, is, there a, uh, is there a film for you that you're like, this is my favorite, or you like them all on different... No, I don't. I don't think about it. I think I had the most fun of the pictures. The pictures I wrote and directed, the one I had the most fun making was Four Seasons. No. And and it was the most personal one I did. And my wife was writing a book about it at the time. And she's a photographer. And we used her pictures in the in the movie because one of the characters is a photographer. And and the pictures were kind of funny. And the photographer was a kind of obsessive person. So in the, in the rolling credits at the end, when they would say photos by Arlene Alder, there'd be like a gasp in the audience. They thought I was making fun of my wife. Yeah, right. But it was she She was good-natured to make the pictures for the character. Yeah. You know? Because the character does get attacked attack kind of yeah, for, for taking the, the for, for those weird vegetable pictures, <laughs> vegetables flying in the air. You know? <laughs> um, but that was the most fun for me. And but it's all it's interesting even the ones the one where i had the least fun i learned a lot of stuff and uh that's ultimately the best if you can if you learn I, I think for me anyway but does it feel like that when you're directing the film and you're kind of lost from it uh, it's got to be does somewhat, it feel like what but it's got to be a scary situation or you feel like at least i'm learning as i'm going oh, along through i don't remember ever being scared directing because yeah. I'm sort of arrogant. But, <laughs> yeah, that helps, doesn't it? It helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. you know, you know. <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't think I'm really arrogant, but I, I, I do, I do put myself in the position a lot. I, you didn't ask me about this, but I'm going to tell you about Good. this great thing about myself. <laughs> I, I put myself in the position of not knowing if I'm going to be able to accomplish this thing. So I do, in a way, scare myself like that. I give talks at places where I have no business going <laughs> and uh and it's momentarily scaring and then scary I mean and then there's this tremendous sense of achievement if I can get away with it or or actually deliver the goods but heading there when you're driving there yeah you know, sometimes my heart's racing <laughs> like how do I get out of this yeah I once was giving a talk at the Grand Rounds session of the Psychiatric Institute at Cornell. Uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say to a hundred psychiatrists? <laughs> so I decided to talk about what I knew about, which was fame. And 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 because um, I didn't think they would know an awful lot about that. But there are some connections because um, in fame, people think they know who you are. And in the psychiatric situation, there's transference where they... They have a connection to who they think you are, who you aren't necessarily. It happens on both sides. Sure. So I, I'm getting, I'm going to talk about fame, right? So I'm on, in the taxi cab and we have to go to York Avenue or someplace. And I'm trying to remember what I'm going to say. And the cab driver has this radio program in Russian blaring from the radio. And then he's on the telephone yelling in Russian. And then he takes a wrong turn and starts taking me downtown. And I can say, would you first of all get off the phone because it's against the law and you're making me late? He says, I can't get off the phone. I'm on the radio. <laughs> he was calling into this call-in Russian radio program complaining about something and driving me all over New York. 
So I'm trying to get to this appointment where I'm supposed to talk about fame to psychiatrists while he's having his 15 minutes. <laughs> fame is a, a, a very strange thing. Um, I mean, it's... Uh, particularly now, don't you think almost everyone wants to be famous or the, even the 15 they, they minutes? They do. They do. Yeah. You know, you know what always shocks me is when, and I know some rich people, really rich people, and they also want to be famous and they do things to get famous. Why would you, if you have money, if you, if you can be rich without being famous, take it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, that's ideal mm -hmm. because it takes time and effort and money to be famous. And you don't really, maybe you get a table in a restaurant and then the service is bad because then they're, they're busy think, thinking <laughs> about what are you really like? <laughs> what are you really doing? Yeah. But you did aim towards fame. Uh, as I didn't aim toward it. I aimed toward trying to be uh, a good actor. And then I got into this thing that made me more famous. And you couldn't have gotten more famous than what you eventually got. I mean, you yeah. were on a TV show that the last night of that show, the last night of MASH, the country absolutely sat down and just watched yeah, Half the, the country watched at the same time. That was amazing. 125 million. People. Something like that. Yeah, and I, I don't think anybody really knows, because in many places they were watching in large groups, and at least one town they took over the town hall, and like half the town came in and watched it. So if they had a Nielsen box on their TV set, they thought one or two people were watching. Right. And there were hundreds, but it, it was um, oh, like a hundred and five, hundred and ten, I don't know, a million, and it was amazing. It, it was an amazing experience driving in the streets because we saw it on a big screen at at the 20th century fox studio and then we all went out to dinner together and as we were driving that's when the show was actually on the air and i suddenly said to the people in the car look at this the streets are empty they must be watching the show because at that time of night the streets were often clogged so it was a strange experience we really didn't understand how how much we had penetrated into the culture while we were making it. We never got that until it was over. And nothing like that will ever happen again because there's too many yeah. TV stations. Too many stations. That the audiences, as they say, fragmented. But I always thought our audience was fragmented to start with. Right. <laughs> that is true. Everybody watched that show for different reasons. Yeah, they did. I, always... I, had, I had mothers come up to me and say, oh, I just want you to know my son watched your show and became a doctor. And the next one comes and well, my, my son watched your show and joined the Army. <laughs> I said, uh, did he watch the whole show? <laughs> 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 well, a lot of times people say, like, you'll see the list of greatest sitcoms, and they'll put that in them like a sitcom. I know. They're I hate operating. that word. I always hated the word. I would never yeah. call it that. It, it, first of all, it's even a misnomer for, for sitcoms, because it, they usually don't have a situation anymore. There used to be, used to be an uh, interesting, funny situation to get the characters into, and they'd have to get out. Now it's mainly uh, people standing up insulting each other. And then they sit on the couch. The couch is always, the couch is always in the same place. Do you yes. notice that? And behind them is a staircase going up. Yeah. Archie Bunker lives. Yeah, it's the same set. Yeah, same yeah. set. Something's a little more upscale, a little more downscale. I think Fraser Fraser had a a little step up to the dining yeah. level. But he was a professor, so that's sure. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was considered a leap ahead. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> it's amazing how they changed television. Um, well, you, the science stuff that you're doing now, uh, and I do think it all ties back in together. For you know, when I read some of the stories that you've written, it, that it always comes back to being curious mm -hmm. about the way the world works. You got into acting because you're curious about the way people work is there anything that you didn't get the chance to do that you wish you would have had the opportunity to do i don't think so i i think most of the things i there, there were a couple of movies that i was asked to do that i couldn't do that that i thought later that would, would have been would have been good to to be and i would have i would have learned a lot and i would have gotten better um but i, I don't really regret anything i regret little personal things 
Every once in a while, I'll be driving in the car, and my wife will see me wince. I'll go like this. She'll say, what, what? I say, no, that's 20 years ago. <laughs> something I said. I would have said something to offend somebody, or I would have been stupid about something and thoughtless. And it, You know how they say your life passes in front of you just before you're going to die? Might yeah. happen. That happens to me every day. <laughs> I, I'm constantly, I don't, and, and it's not real regret. It's just a cringe. Yeah. You need an editor. You need to sit there. Maybe I should smoke something. <laughs> well, this is the right place yeah. for that. <laughs> uh, I have to tell you, it's, uh, you know, you know, we started this talking about the work, but for anyone listening, the I think the real important story here that Alan is teaching us is how to live a life. Oh, and I wouldn't dare you to so teach much. you that. Hey, but thank you for saying that. I, you're doing it, my friend. Alan Alda, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.